So, um, I did a video, and I suspect most people have seen the video. Uh, it's on the ESRB. They came out and they said that loot boxes are not gambling and blah, blah, blah. There's arguments on both sides, right? Uh, it's It's one of those situations where I can see the arguments on both sides and they make sense. From a literal exact definition of here's exactly what gambling is, yeah, no, they're probably not. Uh, but whether it would be worthwhile for a group like the ESRB to consider them to be something akin to virtual gambling or pseudo gambling, that's a bit of a different matter. And you don't need a legal definition for them to take that stance. Peggy's the same way. Peggy said, oh, we're going to wait until the gambling commissions make up their minds. Now, there's been a bit of a push in the UK to try and, or in, in Europe in general, rather, to try and curb some of this. But I feel a little bit vindicated today, actually. Um, this news coming out about Activision and their fancy patent is very interesting. But before I get ahead of myself, I want to go back to an article that I read two years ago. And uh, it was something that came from somebody who is an anonymous source in the game industry that worked on freemium titles, right? Mobile titles, a lot of that kind of stuff where you get a lot of these, it's all about the microtransactions. It's all about, uh, you know, pushing to the whales. So they say, I'm not entirely convinced that that's the case all the time, but anyways, that's what they say. And in the mobile market, uh, this individual claims, and there have been a couple of follow-ups uh, confirming some of these sorts of details that Mobile apps know so much about the end user that they can tailor the experience to that user. Not just, you know, here's how the game plays. Is it good? Is it fun? But here's how we pull more money out of people and being able to completely customize everything about how the game works in order to maximize that sort of stuff. So what he was talking about at the time uh, were things like, for example, after somebody pays a bunch of money, levels are really easy for a little while, and then they start to get harder again. And the next time that person pays money, what the company wants to do is replicate that earlier experience, right? If, if you've paid money and you got a good experience out of it, you're starting down that conditioning road of, of uh, basically positive reinforcement saying that, yes, you did this correctly, you should pay some money again. And if they reinforce that the next time that you buy microtransactions, continue doing this all of the time, then you're going to end up with a customer who continues to buy. They already proved that they were susceptible once. Um, there have been cases where a game will become more difficult very actively after a period of time from when you have bought microtransactions, because again, they know that now they're starting to frustrate you, but you're already invested. You've paid money in at the start, right? You're already more likely to go and buy some more later. So very recently, we had a, a Rolling Stone article about Activision, and they were going through some of these old patents. And Activision has a patent back from, I think it was 2015, that talks about uh, microtransactions specifically relating to matchmaking in games. And their patent was for the idea behind matching up players based on what one person has and what one person doesn't have in order to convince the person who doesn't have it to buy it. Now, that's, that's a little scary, isn't it? Like bloody well insidious, actually, is the term I've used a couple of times to describe this. Um, this is very interesting for a lot of reasons because, I mean, for starters, it doesn't really surprise me, uh, but you can see all kinds of different ways that it could be used in a practical sense. One of the examples given in the patent was the idea of somebody who sort of fancies themselves a sniper, right? They're playing that sniper sort of character. They're maybe not very good at it. And so the game then matches them in multiplayer games with somebody that has a really nice sniper rifle. And then that person wants to buy that sniper rifle, right? You could see something like this going into Star Wars Battlefront 2, for example, right? The way that the microtransactions are going there, it certainly is a conceivable possibility. Now, to take a, another example that we all know and love, uh, or some of us know and love, uh, Overwatch, right? If I play Junkrat an awful lot, but I never buy any microtransactions, 
it's entirely conceivable that the game is going to put me into a match where the other person that plays Junkrat an awful lot that I'm going to be competing with for a spot might actually have a whole bunch of cool looking Junkrat skins. There are so many different ways that these kinds of things can be manipulated, can be turned towards the advantage of the business. And it's not necessarily all on the up and up. It's very, very disappointing to see Activision going down this route. Now, you can't look at a patent and say, this is how it's currently being done. It's just that they have a patent for it. Whether they're using it or not is a matter of debate. Something like Overwatch is certainly big enough where you could do some of that kind of micro-targeting of the matchmaking experience. They have enough players uh, in order to, to do that where you're not necessarily going to notice an incredibly long matchmaking time while it's trying to wait and find somebody to bring together with you in a group that's going to be making you more likely to buy something. Smaller games that have fewer players, obviously this would be much more difficult with, but really big franchises, I mean, you could certainly see it in matchmaking in something like Destiny 2, for example, right? The amount of people that are playing this is phenomenal. But to go back to the, the example that um, the freemium guy from two years ago, um, the amount that they know about people is actually quite stark. And it's also scary. Um, he went down the road of, of explaining that th they'll actually go and they'll find you on Facebook and try and figure out what you like on Facebook. Now, that's a little bit, you know, conspiratorial almost, but then again, we have been seeing micro-targeting of ads uh, on Facebook that potentially influenced a U.S. presidential election. It's kind of a big deal. It's it's an important thing. It's a, it's a way of reinforcing some sort of belief system um, without a person really knowing that they're doing it. And if all it takes is somebody on your Facebook feed sharing a really awesome skin in a game that they got, uh, if you're one of those people that adds anybody and everybody to Facebook, of which there are a lot of, um, it's entirely possible that you could see some kind of micro-targeting that way. Now, the reason that I feel vindicated, and I, I, uh, I don't want to sound egotistical about this, but I've been trying to push some of these kinds of concepts for a little while now, right? It's not just about, you know, whether it's cosmetic or whether it affects the game in any meaningful way. There's a lot more to this than that. Um, I like Las Vegas. I really like Las Vegas. Always have, ever since I, f I went for the first time. And for a while, I was running a, a virtual network uh, under an MCN on YouTube, and I was recruiting channels. Um, help them get their monetization stuff, help them with tags, you know, all of that kind of usual bullshit. Um, I mean, it's a little embarrassing to admit, but it is something that, that I did do. And I went to the point where I decided I was going to go to Las Vegas. Um, and it was during the time where they had their G2E conference, right? So this is the, the gaming expo for the slot machine world or for the casino industry. And if you think that gaming as we de define gaming uh, is correct, you're actually incorrect. Uh, slot machines and gambling was termed gaming long ago. If you look at gambling rules and all that, they all talk about the gaming industry or gaming as a thing. They're talking about gambling when they say that. So I went to G2E. And I got a chance to actually sit down and, and talk with some of these different slot machine manufacturers. And it was very interesting to hear how some of the different mechanics work. Because remember, they're a manufacturer. They don't really care what the casino is actually doing. They don't really care what the rules are. Their job is to try and create the most appealing product, right? They're trying to sell to me. They, I, I'm not necessarily telling them that, hey, I, you know, I, I don't do anything. I'm never going to buy these from you, right? This is a sales pitch from them to me saying, here's why you should buy this slot machine for your casino or whatever the case. Um, and the amount of micro-targeting and, and influence that a casino has over a slot machine is quite high. Uh, they can change the payout percentage on the fly by the user. They can change it based on patterns. They can change it based on all kinds of things. Right. So this is something that has been going on for a long time. It, it is not something that is new. And, and I find it very interesting to look at, you know, the Activision patent and see, OK, so they're they're taking a look at in the same year, mind you, that we had somebody coming out and saying, here's what the freemium market is doing. And here's a patent from Activision that says, here's a way we can do exactly that. 
we can target our microtransactions down to the person based on what makes that person more likely to buy something. That's scary stuff. It really is, but very interesting at the same time. Uh, you know, and then to look back again, Activision bought King. King makes Candy Crush. King was one of, if not the most successful mobile developers of all time. So while you can't necessarily take patents as you know, gospel of this is exactly what they're doing. At this point, I'd kind of be surprised if they weren't. Um, the, this is one of those things that yeah, with, with everything that's been going on in the gaming industry thus far and all the things we have seen and we have found out, this is one of those behind the scenes things that you'll never know. You'll never actually be able to find out whether or not there is a matchmaking algorithm that is putting you next to a person that owns a skin that it knows you want, right? Get down even further for the matchmaking. If you look in Overwatch, for example, okay, you go into the hero screen where you can look at all the different skins and animations and things like that. If you spend more time hovering your mouse over a skin for Roadhog or Reinhardt or Take your pick, it doesn't matter. Blizzard knows how long you looked at that character. If they choose to measure that, they know the answer to that question. Okay. And there's no way for you to know whether or not that's the case. Now, it does sound conspiratorial, absolutely. But if you were a business and you had the opportunity to know anything and everything about what a player is doing playing your game, how long they're playing it, <clears throat> excuse me, what time of day, who they're playing it with, what they're doing in the game, which matches, what characters they're playing. How much time do they spend on the character? How good are they at the character? Do they seem like they're the kind of person that really wants to be better at that character, but isn't? Um, cosmetics are not a, a an easy way out of this. Saying that it's just cosmetic and it doesn't affect the game. Well, if you're being matched into a match with a bunch of people that uh, it thinks you're more likely to buy additional stuff because they happen to be there, yeah, then it certainly affected the game. Anyways, I just wanted to do a, a quick little sort of ad hoc feedback loop on this one because it's something that I, I find very interesting. It's a very fascinating part of business, the analytics of all of this stuff. So thank you for tuning in. And now it's time for me to get to some XCOM 2 and we'll see about killing some patrons uh, in a virtual fashion. Uh, this is not a threat of any kind, except perhaps for their pride. <laughs>